So you see on the screen, you see some of the more vivid uh, in-class exercises. I think we're finally with this last in-class exercise, uh, we're starting to get at strategies, really kind of pinpoint strategies for success in this course and in this uh, education and in this profession. This battery is completely dead. Okay, no time for that. So um, part of the reason it seemed, part of the reason the Frank Lloyd Wright stuff seems suddenly to make some sense, right? Am I getting that right? It seems to have some relevance to what you do in studio and what architects do. Uh, don't get, don't get too excited. Don't think that the course is suddenly t turning a corner. Uh, I don't think so. I just think Frank Lloyd Wright's work lends itself really well to teaching and to extract, abstracting principles that can be th then be applied. And that's part of the reason why uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work had such a profound impact, not just in the United States, but all over the world in part because his work had such clear fundamental principles underlying them. Uh, they, you could express it in words, you can express it in sketches, uh, in quick little vignettes, and then you can apply them. You can interpret them and apply them to different situations. So these principles of the Prairie School architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, really uh, show how the, the study of history can have a very immediate and direct impact on what you do in school. And I predict that years from now, I have this time travel thing that I have access to. Years from now, you're going to be sitting with a client, you're going to be doing uh, you're going to be producing, you're going to be designing a house for your client, and you're going to, it's going to strike you, oh my God, I, I'm still paying these huge monthly student loans, uh, and it's interfering with my ability to save my marriage by buying a house, and yet somehow, somehow, I don't feel like my architectural education ever prepared me to design a house for this client. Except maybe when I was studying Frank Lloyd Wright's Prairie School Architecture. So don't be surprised if that happens. In a way, architecture school is really good at helping you learn how to learn. But there is so much to learn, so much to master in the profession of architecture that, sorry to disappoint you, uh, and if you're really disappointed, maybe you want to study engineering. We're not teaching you everything you need to know. There's too much to know. I'm still struggling to figure stuff out for my clients uh, in my design work. Sorry, but we are teaching you how to learn from the world. Uh, remember, I'm still number four. Number one is still the world, and number two is still the set of skills and methods of architectural analysis, study, production that gives uh, architects the superpower of seeing things that nobody else can see. We see the world in section, we see the world in ways through architectural methods of representation that reveal things and give us access to understandings that other people don't have. Okay. 
So these are just some uh, examples. It worked so well, let's see if we can prolong it. Uh, this next exercise that we have for today is uh, different in that um, this not, we're not studying one architect today. We're studying several dozen, and we're, we're studying four distinct movements in Europe. Uh, this is the first of two lectures. This should say avant-garde number one. On uh, Next Tuesday, you're going to get avant-garde number two. And this is uh, a really exciting topic because after Art Nouveau, arts and crafts, Beaux arts, neoclassicism, Gothic revival, all of those 19th century eclecticism, all of those historic, historicizing styles of architecture design. Uh, after we study that, we move uh, very abruptly into the 20th century, where Frank Lloyd Wright is really revolutionizing uh, developing a whole new set of principles of how to generate form. Uh, and we move into uh, a whole, not just Frank Lloyd Wright, but a whole series of independent developments all over the world, especially in Europe. And so the kind of, uh, let me, let's just quickly go over the kind of exam questions you might get based on the material in the lecture today. And um, this is a way to prepare your mind. This is like a scavenger hunt. What are you looking for? You're looking for these kinds of connections. Uh, and so we're going to look again at the Dutch de Stijl movement. Here in the United States, we call it de Stijl for some reason. We want to sound Dutch by not pronouncing it in the way the Dutch language would have you pronounce it. Go figure. But um, the Dutch de Stijl movement, uh, and so just as we've been doing all semester, the key thing is you need to show and explain. That we're playing by Missouri rules. You really shouldn't try to say anything unless you're showing it. Same as in the studio. If you're not showing it, you're not allowed to attempt to say it. And so it's, this is inviting you to show us specific aspects of Gerrit Rittfeld's 1923 Schroeder Short, House in Utrecht, the Netherlands, that, are, that demonstrate what happens, what does de style architecture do, and how does it do it? What does the architecture do, and how does the architecture do it? That's the question that uh, is at the core of the discipline, the core of this program. Everything you do in studio is all about what is the form, what is the form doing, and how does it do it? So why not make that at the core of your study of the history of architecture? Similarly, here's an example of a painting by El Lizitsky, this Russian guy and a piece of architecture proposed by the same guy, El Lizitsky. And now the question is, show and explain at least two key points about the relationship between painting and architecture through this work. And this is a little foreshadowing of what is a big deal in this lecture. This lecture, I've given different versions of this lecture at RISD, at MIT, uh, and here, and I like to call it painting in space. Uh, because these movements all emerge at a moment when the arts are radicalized and revolutionizing from within, and they're having a profound impact. And all of this is happening in parallel with radical social political movements that are occurring all over Europe, especially Europe. Uh, and it gets to this question, this statement, right? So who agrees with this? Form follows function. Who's with me? Raise your hand. Form follows function. 
But wait a minute. What's this word follow? How does that word function in this sense? Yeah, function comes first, and then form comes out of it, right? Obviously. And you guys go into studio, and you sit down, and your professor says, uh, whatever your professor says, she's saying what she's saying, but no matter what she's saying, basically the expectation is that you got to come up with a form, right? You got to generate a form. And so what are you, what are you going to do? You got to generate a form. What are you going to do? Call her. That's usually the answer. What are you going to do? You have to generate a form. Who's, who's face is following? At least 16, or at least 16,000, at least 16,000 different, no, at least 16 gazillion, at least 16 gazillion different designs can come out of a single function. Damn, now what are you going to do, right? It didn't really narrow it down to a single solution. So, next time you hear someone say form follows function, I want you to ask them, does form follow function? Which form? Or a better answer is, the better response is, well, which form? If there are 16 gazillion forms that can all perform this same function, then how do you generate form? It turns out that having a deep understanding of function is an excellent way to evaluate the performance of a form. Does that make sense? Understanding the function gives you an excellent way to evaluate the performance of a form. But it's not so good at generating a form. If you think that you're developing a form out of the function, I'll bet you, you show me that form that you developed out of function, you're just doing what you've seen, right? I can't remember where I saw this. Like when we put freshmen in a, in a room and we say, okay, design a house, di design uh, your dream house, design, you can, it can be anything, design, it ends up being a lot like the house they grew up in. Try it. Because we tend to repeat what we know. So there's a normative instinct in humans, and you're going to school. The reason you're going to school, one of the reasons you're going to school, and one of the reasons you're sitting in the studio is to find ways to generate new form that can liberate you from just repeating what history has shown you before, right? Who struggles with this? Have you run into this problem? When you're not paying attention, when you're not careful, you end up repeating things that you've seen. And that can be okay, but it's better if you see it happening and you understand it. So I'm visiting you from the future. I just came back from 2021, and many of you are in the thesis studio with me and my colleagues. And you've brought with you, uh, even though you heard it back in 2018, 
that form follows function is not necessarily a good strategy for developing design. We talked about this. And remember back in 2018, we had this conversation? Well, in 2021, in the thesis studio, some of you don't remember the conversation we had back in 2018. And it's a little disappointing to me, but I'm willing to have it again, right? Form follows function is an excellent strategy for evaluating the performance of a design. Remember when I said that back in 2018? But that leaves us with the problem of generating form. Where does form come from? That's the question. That's the question of studio. That is the question of uh, this moment in architectural history. And it's the key question of this lecture. Where does form come from? And based on what I just said about the 19th century, in the 19th century, what was our first lecture? The Enlightenment, then Neoclassicism, then Gothic Revival, then uh, I don't remember what, housing, all of these things, Arts Nouveau, Arts and Crafts, uh, Beaux-Arts. In each one of these cases, where does form come from? It comes from history. It comes from the past. It comes from precedence. How many of you have done a precedent study in studio? That's all you do, right? Are you in the middle of one right now? What are you guys looking at for precedent studies? Libraries. Awesome. So, um, where does form come from? Another way to say that, what are the generative criteria for architectural form? So we're gonna look at a revolution in painting that became a revolution in architecture that held the promise of a revolution in society. And the cartoon version of modernism is driven by technology. So there's this technological driver that is a cartoon version of history. We developed, through the Industrial Revolution, we developed new materials, new structural capacities, which drove the design. It generated, it generated new forms because of the new technical capacities of steel, glass, and reinforced concrete electricity, elevators, et cetera. Well, there's, that is real, that is a very important force to recognize, but it's not the only one. The lecture next Tuesday will touch a great deal on the technological drivers of new forms emerging out of, through architectural expression. This lecture has more to do with the arts. And so we're gonna look at four distinct avant-garde movements, and they are associated with specific nation states of Europe. And uh, they, it has, uh, they revolve around and are influenced by the historic force of World War I, which at the time was not called World War I because there was no plan for doing it again. Unlike the current situation, there is a plan for doing it again. Um, and so, sorry about that. But around World War I, and I put it in red because every educated citizen of the world needs to know this is an anchor point. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in what year? 1492. <laughs> Don't laugh, this is hard. And World War I was when? 1914, 1918. And then the other one that should be on here, and I would be typing it if I, if I could, is the Soviet, uh, the Russian Revolution of 1917, was a similarly 
cataclysmic, earth-altering uh, revolution moment in time, 1917, Russian Revolution. So the four uh, movements that we're going to look at are the Italian futurists, and we're marking them by the moment of their manifesto. So if you're going to generate a new vocabulary, a new language of architectural form, around this time, uh, the custom was that you write a manifesto. And we have a bunch of manifestos up on Blackboard for you to read. Um, it used to be you would write a treatise, like last fall you studied Vitruvius's treatise, Alberti's treatise, Palladio's treatise, all these guys writing treatises. Then earlier in this semester, uh, we went from treatise writing to visionary architecture. So Ledoux and Boulay designed these huge projects that couldn't be built, like the Cenotaph to Newton. If you wanted to change architecture, design a monumental, huge building on, on paper, but uh, you can't build it. Now, we're entering the age of the manifesto. If you want to change the world, write a manifesto. And these manifestos were written uh, sometimes by artists, by painters, sometimes sculptors, but more often than not, it would be a community of collaborators, poets, jazz musicians, artists, painters, sculptors, architects, and so here we go. And we saw this in the introductory lecture, uh, and these, this is a typical depiction of what we think we're supposed to do when we study architectural history or any history, is kind of keep track of the strands of thought streaming through the march of time. Um, a few things that are, might be worth noting here are um, art for art's sake. Uh, the, and this is connected with the idea that painting can be autonomous from everything else. It can be separate, it can be its own thing. And that led to the idea that architecture should be able to be autonomous from everything else. Uh, which was a very powerful theory in the late 20th century that came out of this moment 100 years earlier. But here's where we see the idea that lies behind this lecture and next Tuesday's lecture is that we use this word avant-garde. Avant-garde is an, uh, a French word for the advanced forces of a military force you send your best soldiers out front to cut through enemy lines. They're the avant-garde. They're the, the uh, point of the spear. They cut through the enemy lines. And so for the art community to uh, embrace these militaristic imagery and uh, embrace the idea that they are part of an avant-garde is pretty serious. So uh, it, it starts with painting. And uh, there's lots of names of painters who uh, you should recognize. Paul Gauguin, Henri Matisse, Vincent van Gogh, or Vincent van Gogh, Edvard Munch. Uh, these are names that you probably know, uh, you grew up knowing. Uh, you're required to still know those. Um, but the key thing here is once you invent the camera, and photography, why do we need to paint anymore? The Raphaelite school of painting, so goes the cartoon version of art history, is all about creating a perfect replica of visual reality. And that's the goal. But that is not the total goal, even when that is a prerequisite for excellent, successful painting, there was always something else going on. There was the capturing of a feeling, right? Who's with me? Capturing of a feeling. It's not just photographic uh, perfection. And so once you have photography in the camera, something happens. That thing, that feeling becomes liberated. 
you do not, if, if, there, if we have cameras and photography for capturing exact uh, perfection of visual reality, then what's left to do with painting? Well, in a way, painting is liberated at this point, and painting can do what it needs to do independent of perfect replicas. So this guy, Paul Cezanne, who's heard of Paul Cezanne? Okay, so Paul Cezanne is the hero of this story because he pursues this question with uh, an enthusiasm that turns the, the world on its head. And it's almost like a Zen Buddhist transforming the world when he says, a time is coming when a carrot, freshly observed, will trigger a revolution. So what should be clear in this is it's not the carrot that's triggering the revolution. It's the manner of its observation. As soon as you can look at reality in a new way and see it in a new way, you have just changed the, the range of possibilities for, for human existence. So he uh, goes to the south of France and he paints the same mountain over and over and over again for the rest of his life. Uh, so he starts this when he is 43 years old and when he dies in 1906, uh, he's basically been painting this scene. And I, you know I don't put uh, the beginning and end dates on buildings because you guys have enough to remember, right? But here it matters. He sets up the canvas in front of the scene and every day he wakes up and there it is, year after year after year. And every once in a while, he just puts it down and says, oh, I gotta start over again. But you see in the progression of these paintings, the birth of multiple schools of painting. So you see cubism in the houses, you see uh, the chiaroscuro of the dark outlines in the third painting, you see impressionism. He was considered an impressionist, but he is so much more than an impressionist. So he is inventing multiple schools of painting in this series, all of the exact same scene. And the one to look at at the end, uh, there is a dematerialization of reality. Uh, all of a sudden, painting, liberated from the task of photographic uh, veracity, making an exact replica of the reality, it is liberated to take on a new relationship to reality. Its primary purpose is to capture a feeling, a spirit, and this becomes the basis for uh, what some people called non-objective art, which is to say there's no object. Of course, in these paintings, there are objects. There are real objects. But the relationship between those objects and the painting are loosened, presaging, foretelling, anticipating the complete liberation between objective reality and painting. And so once that happens, you get freedom of expression, of color, of form, of uh, whereas previously, if I could see, as your instructor in art school, if I could see a brush stroke anywhere on your canvas, I would kick you out of school because we can't afford to graduate anyone from this school of painting uh, who lets their brush strokes show. It needs to be a perfect uh, capturing of reality. All of a sudden, think of Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night. It's all about the brush stroke. Edward Munch. It's all about the expressive character of the brush strokes and the capacity of painting to capture the spirit, the feeling beyond the objective reality of, uh, of what is available visually. I, I remember this. The sky was dark red and this is exactly how I felt. Right? A photograph won't capture. 
election day last year. So this led to multiple schools of thought, uh, groups formed, individual artists, and they were talking not just about this revolution in the way we see the carrot, the way we see the world, the way we paint, but it required us to remake the nature of social relationships, economic relationships, political arrangements. It was revolution. First, change the way you see, and then change, you, then everything else follows. Uh, you hear the same thing if you, who watches Homeland? Never mind. At the beginning, there's a, okay. There's, there's a poet from the 60s who talks about the revolution uh, will not be televised. They're talking about the civil rights movement. The first step of revolution is change your mind. Uh, it's a direct quote from, uh, that's quoted in the opening sequence, the credits of Homeland. It, this uh, is the same thing. Step one in transforming the world, change your own mind. Buddhism says the same thing. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we get the German expressionists. So don't get the German expressionists mixed up with, don't get the avant-garde, uh, the Thursday, today's avant-garde German expressionists mixed up with next Tuesday's German uh, Werkbund revolutionaries. They're more transforming society through the technical production of art objects, whereas these guys, the German Expressionists, are using artistic vision, not industrial production. So it's confusing because these are two very distinct schools of thought, so different that uh, one's in today's lecture, the other German school is in next Tuesday's lecture. They're both German, they're both at the same time, but they're very different. The nation state doesn't always sort things out so clearly. So Bruno Taut um, is one of these manifesto writers of German expressionism. Uh, he is an artist and an architect who's also a political activist who is organizing the revolution for how we see the world, how we produce everyday objects, and of course, how we produce our built environment. Some of these modern movements of the early modern movement era thought that we were revolutionizing the world and architecture should follow along behind and reflect those changes. But a lot of them, some of the more interesting ones, uh, took and reversed that order. And Bruno Taut is one of them. Bruno Taut is one of the people who said the world has changed through the visions of artists and now we must remake the world as if from scratch. Step one in remaking the world, who are you going to call? The architects. So the architects are the ones who are going to transform the world. Who knew? So Bruno Taut is invited to one of these expositions. Of course, it's industrial production. It's uh, beginning of the 20th century. Germany is trying to frantically to catch up with France and England. Remember the Crystal Palace in 1851? The French exposition where they're building the Eiffel Tower? The Germans are late to the game. They're still in the parking lot when uh, the, the, the first innings of uh, the industrial competition between Britain and France are already being played, right? So Germany is trying to play catch up, so they have to hold their own exposition. Steel and glass, that's the symbol of the new industrial production. So Bruno Taut, uh, similar to what Cezanne said about the carrot, Bruno Taut is deeply influenced by this poet visionary, Paul Schierbert. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides of this guy. Um, but he basically is quoting Schierbert here when he says, glass destroys hate. 
which is a very interesting quote because if the mission is to destroy hate, he's saying, call up the architects and have them design with more glass. It used to be that the biggest pane of glass you could make uh, because you, you melt the silica and you pour it on a sheet of oil, you could make glass like this big and then you could make it bigger. But soon, through industrial techniques, suddenly in the 20th century, you can start to uh, float large sheets of glass uh, to create much larger panes of glass. And so he designs this glass pavilion uh, for this uh, industrial exposition, showing, blowing everyone away in terms of what you can do with steel and glass. Who'd, who'd have thought it, right? So steel and glass, there, where's the masonry? Where's the frame? These are frameless steel and glass structures. Crazy. And here's the inside. So glittering reflective surfaces, light pouring in from above, waterfall. And Bruno Taut, so um, that was in 1914, and they anticipated going crazy, transforming, rebuilding the world, starting with Germany. But what happens in 1914? World War, the World War, at the time called the Great War. The Great War breaks out, and what happens to the architecture business? It tanks, it tanks. So no work for the architects. So what does Bruno Taut do? He does what we do in times of economic downturn. We either uh, get a job in food service, or the hotel industry, or we go overseas, in my case, uh, or we draw, we start drawing like crazy. So Bruno Taut starts drawing visions of glass architecture, and this vision of glass architecture turns into a vision of glass cities. And so he publishes uh, in 1919 this volume of drawings called the Stockchrome which means the city crown. He is picturing at the center of every European city the way to stop the war, the way to unify all these warring nations is to do what they did in the Middle Ages, is to build cathedrals at the center of every town and unify Europe through these pilgrimage routes of Christian, Christendom. But of course, this is the modern revolutionary equivalent of it. So there's no church, there's no God, there's no king. There are only civic, a, a socialist, a commitment to socialist principles of equality and fairness and peace and no more war. And how are you gonna do this? Who are you gonna call? You call the architects and they build these glass cathedrals at the center of every European city and the nation states dissolve into a unified Europe. And uh, you model these, these city crowns uh, after the jagged peaks of the Alps of Europe, of course. So there's the Matterhorn over here. Who's been? You will. The Matterhorn is here, and uh, emulating the Matterhorn are all these Stadtkronen, all these city crowns. And no sooner does he uh, publish and exhibit the 1919 Stadtkron city crown uh, publication when he is ready to publish an even grander version of his vision, which is Alpine architecture. And so you see these shining, glorious, utopian, idealistic, the solutions uh, to stop the war, stop the violence, stop the killing, unify all European nations around these ideas of architecture. Transparency is the key to a rational, honest, transparent, uh, open source idea, uh, honesty, 
of no more lying, no more corruption, no more secrets, and it's all about the glass architecture. Glass destroys hate. Who knew? And so on and on he goes, and he actually produces these quite concrete, real plans for city civic centers to rival what's going on with the City Beautiful movement back in the United States, in the Philippines, and all over the world. And so he is continuing to, to develop uh, this idea of glass architecture, glass and steel, um, throughout this period. His fellow German Expressionist, who we love to uh, refer to, is Eric Mendelssohn, who uh, designs all these buildings that seem to flow in a painterly manner. So there's less glass involved, but there's still this flowing form that seems to come directly out of painting. It's also coming out of the new possibilities of uh, steel reinforced concrete construction. So there is a technical element here. Um, but the irony is that this building is actually made out of brick. Uh, brick layers lay it up, and they make it seem like it's flowing, like it could have been produced through um, uh, reinforced concrete, but it just would cost too much uh, in 1920 to do it that way. Uh, which is a very interesting thing that some people, Mark Goldthorpe over at MIT has a he presented uh, the idea, the theory, that the early modern movement that envisioned this explosion of new forms for architecture, they were premature. They had the imagination, but they didn't have the capability of actually building these things. A hundred years later, for the first time, we're starting to develop the ability to build these things. How would you build this using today's technology? Let's say you had a budget. Well, you'd probably build it the same way they built it. Have you ever done formwork for carpentry? That's a really difficult formwork to construct. You have to do the reverse, the negative out of, out of wood first. How about 3D printing it? Yeah, I think 3D printing. If you could, that's still coming. In the meantime, just build it out of brick. Um, and then plaster over it the way they did. So 100 years later, we're still only now just beginning to develop the capacity to build some of these forms that were imagined in the modern, modern movements, um, especially the German Expressionists. So again, this is kind of like Newton's cenotaph. This is uh, of the Enlightenment era uh, of Boulay. This is a celebration of Einstein and his contributions uh, to theory of theories of physics. Now, at the same time, it's hard to remember this, but at the same time, the whole Chicago thing is happening. There's still Beaux Arts. There's still eclecticism. All of these things are happening at the same time. Here is the winning entry to the Chicago Tribune tower competition of 1922. Uh, it's a Gothic revival, flying buttresses. It's a skyscraper done in Gothic revival. And it was actually built. Here's what Bruno Taut submitted. It was a larger version of his glass pavilion, his 1914 glass pavilion of, uh, of the exposition. That would be an excellent exam question, wouldn't it? Putting those two things together side by side. Now here's the thing that we still are mystified by, enchanted by, and still refer to to the present moment. This guy, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, or otherwise known as Mies. He was around at this time, and he started imagining a new kind of skyscraper very much influenced by the glass chain people uh, of Bruno Taut and the German Expressionists. And he is speculating 
on what would happen if you took those Chicago skyscrapers, uh, remember how the steel goes up in the Jenny uh, Fair store building? You see the structural steel frame, and then they clad it in masonry and terracotta and stone. Well, he's saying, what if you skipped that last step and you left it naked? What if you built the steel frame and instead of then installing uh, the terracotta and stone materials to tidy it up and costume the steel frame and hide the steel frame, what if you just hung glass sheets from that steel frame? What would happen? And believe it or not, what he's doing here, and I do want you to believe it, is he is speculating on what would happen in terms of reflections off the glass. Because when you look at modern skylines now, uh, what's happening in these modern skylines? Do those glass towers look light and transparent? No. They look solid because it's reflective glass. They don't look like this, they look solid. And Mies was trying to solve that problem. That's why he's creating these multiple angles. He's faceting, faceting the facade of the glass towers so that at least one of them will appear transparent, depending on the angle of reflection. Right? You take physics. Who takes physics? Don't you all take physics? Who can hear the sound of my voice? You can't hear the sound of my voice? OK. Just check it. Of those of you who can hear my voice, which is only some of you, how many of you take physics? OK. Um, so do you study optics in physics class? The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of Well, let me, let me fill in the gap there. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction, reflection. So sometimes you're going to get reflections off the glass. Sometimes the angle is such that it doesn't reflect. Sometimes the angle is such that it does reflect. Sometimes if you're looking at the water, you look down, you can see the bottom. But if you look this way, it reflects. That has to do with the angle and the uh, coefficient of reflectance of the material. Ah. Anyway, if you understood the physics, you'd be able to control which facet of the skyscraper is reflecting and which facet of the skyscraper is transparent. Um, Mies van der Rohe is continuing these experiments over the next few years. And some would say, not unfairly, that he gave us the world that we've inherited, which is a world of glass and steel skyscrapers, no masonry showing, uh, minimal steel frame showing. It's just glass. The expressive quality of skyscrapers uh, in the late 20th century is something that he speculated about uh, in the 20s. OK. That's German Expressionism especially Bruno Taut uh, and his glass pavilion. But we have to move on. We're going to move on to Italian futurism. Italian futurism is harder and easier, in part because one of the most abiding principles of Italian futurism is this isn't just a rupture of technical and artistic vision. It is a rupture of human life itself. And we celebrate that human rupture. We celebrate the violence of this new thing, the steel and glass building that uh, is envisioned by Mies gets rubber wheels and starts flying across the landscape, killing everything in its path, including people. And the Italian futurists are saying, yes, there should be death. Every violent transformation requires sacrifice and death. And the Italian futurists 
in their manifesto, Marinetti, do we see Marinetti's name here yet? Yeah, Marinetti. Marinetti, writing in the Italian Futurist Manifesto, he's writing romantically about an automobile crash. He wakes up uh, tasting his own blood, half submerged in a puddle of mud and blood at the side of the road where his car is simmering and burning off to the side, and it's a miracle that he's still alive. Isn't Italian futurist great? Who's with me? No. So it was a celebration of violence, speed, car crashes, warfare, tanks, and artillery. World War I was notoriously a shocking, horrible revelation about the destructive power of the Industrial Revolution. Mustard gas, new, larger bombs. Uh, the death and destruction was unprecedented. World War I was a horrible experience. For everyone except the Italian futurists, they loved it. They thought this is the key to everything. Get rid of everything that's old. Don't just get rid of it. Don't just ignore it. Kill it. Burn it. Uh, make it bleed. And their manifesto is a celebration of violence. Not surprisingly, the key people of the futurist, uh, Italian futurism uh, went to war in World War I and didn't come back. Uh, that's how excited they were about violence. In the meantime, Italian futurist painting gave us, uh, they took this new freedom, this new objectivity, this new relationship between reality and the vision of painting. And they, they warped time. So they were able to create time-lapse photos. Uh, at, the at the same time, the photographers were, the next version of this lecture, I'll put in Moybridge's uh, strobe light photographs. Um, but you've seen those. You know what it looks like. Uh, and here we have multiple images contained in the single one. And there was a very profoundly political uh, aspect of this as well as in the others. This is um, d uh, an anarchist movement trying to destroy all government uh, and see what takes its place in the ensuing chaos. Um, one of the anarchist leaders was killed, uh, and at his funeral, uh, the people at the funeral were attacked by the police, and this is a, a time-lapse uh, strobe light depiction of the violence in the funeral, uh, which anticipates all kinds of things with cubist painting, uh, but you see that once you liberate painting from the shackles of following exactly what the visual reality is, interesting things can happen. And Boccioni, uh, this is one of my favorite things, he imagines that when uh, this man is walking, his muscles on his calf uh, elongate and they take up more space than they do when he's at rest. Same as Duchamp. So you start to see forces that are not visible to the naked eye. Normal people don't see things this way. This is the superpower of the painters of the Italian futurism. And so uh, where's the architecture of Italian futurism? It's very scant, uh, but what exists is vivid and profound and deeply influential. Uh, the architect Antonio Santelia envisions in 1914, a few months before going off to the trenches to die, uh, he draws all these beautiful uh, pencil and watercolor sketches, envisioning the world of, the, of Rome in the year 2000. And he's looking at uh, these big modern infrastructures. Remember in the Enlightenment, we said we had libraries and schools and hospitals and libraries, et cetera, train stations. Well, it's several decades later, and we're starting to have electrical power plants and hydroelectric generating 
uh, stations. And so Santelia is imagining what these new infrastructural programs uh, are going to look like. Now you might say, remembering back form follows function, right? What is the function of the power plant? And there's clearly a form that comes out of that function, right? Well, yes and no. So let's just look at a bunch of these. Here's another power plant. There are lots of ways to put smokestacks in a building. There are lots of ways to enclose uh, a dirigible, a zeppelin. Um, but Santelia is not distracted by the pursuit of this single logical functional form. He is generating forms uh, that are quite powerful. Where are they coming from? They're not coming directly out of the function. Can you evaluate the performance of the design based on its function? Yes. Come up with a form, then ask the question, does it work? Does it generate power? And evaluate that, and based on your answer, based on the feedback at the crit, then make it better. Boost its performance. Maybe change the form so it works better. That is, an, how, that is how evaluative criteria work. But where did this form come from in the beginning? It's hard to tell. Right? That's the mystery of what you guys do in studio. Where does the form come from? I don't know, but show me a form. I'll tell you if it works or not. That's form follows function. Follows is not the right word. Form follows, uh, I don't know. Oh, but that's harder to put on a bumper sticker and sell. But Santelia, uh, looking back, I think I've been here. That actually looks like a train station in Tokyo. He's actually not far off from what actually does happen. And it's not like Star Trek uh, designing the communicator device that then becomes flip phones uh, 30 years later. Uh, th this is true clairvoyance. Maybe he can time travel as well. No time for that. That's Italian futurism. Now, on to movement number three in our rapid breakneck tour of early European modern movements. So we've been talking about the Dutch de style movement uh, for quite a while. Um, what do they do with the newfound freedom? You don't, your painting doesn't have to look like it used to look, doesn't have to look like reality. And your architecture doesn't have to look like the Beaux-Arts. It doesn't have to replicate the classical orders or the Gothic revival style. It doesn't have to do any of that. It can come from wherever. Your form can follow fill in the blank. Here's the painting of Piet Mondrian, who was uh, one of the key figures driving the de Stijl movement. He, more than uh, Cezanne, more than Gauguin, more than all of these guys, is eliminating the depth of three-dimensional space. He is saying it's, it's the new objectivity. The object is not the, the mountain in, on the horizon in the landscape. The thing is a sheet of canvas. The, sh the thing is abstraction in the real world. This is a geometric form of paint on the surface of canvas. I'm not going to pretend it has depth. Uh, it is an abstract form. So, so far, this is the most radical departure from objective space. This is the most non-object 
painting that we've seen. Not only is he rejecting space, he's rejecting all color except for a few select colors which stand in for these forces of human experience, the sun, the earth, uh, the sky. These are the basic elements of color that are allowed into Montreon's world. Now the key figure in the De Stijl movement is Theo van Doesburg, and he is going to show up next Tuesday, I hope. Um, even if he doesn't just know that he's there, he's never officially hired by the Bauhaus uh, School of uh, Architecture. But he gives guest lectures, and he lives in town. And after class, the students leave campus, and they hang out with this guy. And he has a profound impact on what then becomes the Bauhaus, which has had a profound impact <laughs> on what has become schools and education of architecture in North America. Even more so than uh, the Beaux-Arts that we spent a lot of time tracing uh, these terms and these techniques of what you were doing in studio, we've traced them back to the Beaux-Arts. The later and even more dominating influence on what is your education comes from uh, the Bauhaus, and a lot of what we get here from the Bauhaus comes from Van Doesburg. So there's this whole graphic design element of typography. Um, Mondrian's painting, they publish uh, a journal. Um, they are profoundly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. Great exam question. They see the 1910 Wasmuth publication that comes out of Berlin. It goes all over Europe. And as we talked about uh, in the last lecture, there were two very deep impacts on Dutch architecture, just as we saw in the German split between German Expressionism and the German Werkbund that becomes the Bauhaus. There was also a, a multiple branches in the Netherlands. We looked at the Amsterdam School in the brick. They took a, they looked at the arts and crafts aspect of material expression that Frank Lloyd Wright was demonstrating, and they took off in the Brulach designed uh, and de Klerk designs of the what became the Amsterdam School in South Amsterdam. And then the other branch is the more rationalist, abstracted version of the de Stijl, and this is the work of um, Van Doesburg and Esteren. And so Van Doesburg is taking these exploded box, these planes that are flying out from the center. When you explode a box, those planes stay intact, but they separate at the corners and they fly out. And if you freeze them in space, you get falling water. And you get these uh, artists, these compositions, these uh, axonometric visions that the de Stijl movement is producing. And it fits with the painting theory of Mondrian, who says that these abstractions exist in all places. It's up to us, the de Stijl architects and painters, to reveal them to the world. And so you see these abstract planes showing up on the interiors of spaces. And so it's all about these compositions of planes. Now, um, if I were to uh, ask, if you, couldn't, if you couldn't read the caption, I said, who, um, who designed this, what would you guess? It looks like a prairie house. It looks like the Roby house. Well, no coincidence, um, Robert von, Ho von Tehoff uh, visited the Prairie School architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, saw the Vosmuth portfolio, and started designing in the manner of Frank Lloyd Wright, but emphasizing the exploding box, those planes flying out from a center. Uh, another approach is to reinforce the box 
uh, except when it comes to these windows. And this is uh, the corner window is something that de-emphasizes the box. And you will see more and more of this uh, next Tuesday and moving onward. Uh, and then uh, the painters, so we've seen painting, we've seen the painting of interiors, we've seen architecture. This guy is a cabinet maker, and he is saying, what if we took the visual revolution of the De Stijl painters and we produced furniture out of it? And he says, when we look at the paintings, we see these abstract squares and rectangles flying out from some center point and uh, flying out in space. So this is another version of the exploding box. And in some cases, uh, Rittfeld is reinforcing the reality of the armrest by painting multiple sides, multiple adjacent sides the same color. What happens in your brain when you see the black on the top and the black on the side? Compared with what happens in your brain when you see this very bright color that is not the same as the color going around the corner? What happens? Yeah, so the armrests are, are a solid thing and they cut off at the yellow flame. That's part of it. What else is happening? So there's two realities, one where the color turns the corner and one where the color does not turn the corner. 
this is a moment of truth in architecture and in sculpture. It is the unification of two dimensions and three dimensions in a single, in a single construction. It's just a chair. What's the big deal? Well, let's move it into architecture and see what happens. So this is uh, one of the, the great monuments of the 20th century. Go see it. Um, it's the Schroeder House in Utrecht, the Netherlands. And it is really the only fulfilled architectural demonstration of the Gestalt movement. And you see the explosion of the box sending these planes flying out from a center. So the way a lot of people describe what happens in the modern movement, especially von Doesberg and then the Bauhaus, is that we go from the production of box after box after box. We talked about this in the Frank Lloyd Wright lecture. We used to design a lot of boxes next to each other and collect those boxes inside of a box that we call a building. Uh, but now, with Frank Lloyd Wright and the De Stijl, and then to carry it on with uh, the Bauhaus, and now us, we don't do that anymore. We separate them at the corners. We break the planes apart at the corners. So now, the planes are liberated from each other to slide past each other. So when you draw stuff on your in-class exercise, and in the exam, and in your sketch exercise, and in your writing exercise, it would be great to show the two planes that used to come together in a corner separating and sliding past each other. One pulls back, and the other slides forward. And I often tell my students in studio, I say, always do this with your roofs. Ready? You have to look at the hand gestures always do this unless you do this. Never do this. Right? And I realize, after saying that to my students in studio for a decade, I realize that, ah, it's coming from the De Stijl, or Frank Lloyd Wright, or Bauhaus, or God herself. Who knows? It's just it's just the best way to do things. This, or always do this unless you do this, but never do this, okay? And so it shows up in plan. Uh, this was uh, not just Rittfeld. We should give uh, equal credit to the client. Um, and next version of the lecture, I'll make sure I do that. Because she is saying, hey, I want a completely open, main floor, except when uh, people come over, then I want to be able to close it up. So it's all about the sliding planes. It's not just a virtual uh, collection of sliding planes, planes sliding past each other. It's actually Ikea-like, literal sliding planes sliding past each other to create different rooms. Um, so that more people could spend the night. But look at that corner. The dematerialization of the corner, you don't put the structure at the corner, you move it out of the corner, because if you put the structure at the corner, you, you're betraying the whole exploding of the box. And so on. You can look at all kinds of details of this, uh, the way some planes are colored uh, to make them float independently of other elements. And you see the sliding planes that retract into the wall that are used to separate things. And this plane is held uh, apart from the plane of the rest of the wall, not just by the color, but also they are not coplanar surfaces. <laughs>
and throughout, um, there's still some built-in furniture going on, the way the arts and crafts movement, the way Frank Lloyd Wright would do it. Uh, but every element is another opportunity to float planes and lines by coloring the edge of this shelf. It is a two-dimensional expression of floating line in a three-dimensional composition of space. OK, Whew. one more. Russian constructivism. So just as in Germany where things split into two directions, two very distinct directions, and in the Netherlands we've identified at least two, in Russia it splits into a dozen or more different uh, schools of thought. We're not going to talk about all of them. You're welcome. Uh, but if you're interested, you can look at uh, the website Ross Wolf has put together. It's really a thorough examination of all things Russian. If you want to understand where Rem Kolhas is coming from, he is deeply inspired by a lot of the different Russian movements. When he was a student at the Architecture Association in London, uh, he was, uh, did a lot of work looking back to the Russian, the different Russian movements, including Russian constructivism, which is the one that uh, we're looking at. But before we get to constructivism, we're going to look at something called suprematism in painting. Because if, there, if Cezanne and the other painters were hinting at some of the possibilities once you uh, release painting from any uh, connection to objective three-dimensional space and reality, uh, there was a guy, Kazimir Malevich, and he said, what if we went all the way? What if we stripped everything down to nothingness and reconstructed the world from zero? What would that journey be like? And whether you agree with him or not, he says, step one, the black square. Sometimes he said step one is the white square in the void of the blackness of emptiness. But he said white is the emptiness, black is the thing. And so suprematism, the supreme, the exploration of the supreme reality comes out of nothing and starts with the black square. His gravestone, his headstone is a black square. His coffin is a suprematist uh, construction. He was obsessed. <clears throat> but moving very quickly through the suprematism of Kazimir Malevich, we start from nothing, go to the black square, and very quickly we are assembling abstract shapes at, as they float in relationship to each other. Now, you might say, as I do when I look at this, this is more spatial, three-dimensional than uh, the De Stijl movement. Um, yes, these appear to be floating planes. Uh, if we were obsessed with painting, we might dwell on that. But we're architects, so we actually really like this. And sure enough, as soon as Malevich is exploring these things in painting, it's followed up with uh, the evolution of a suprematist architecture which are these uh, studies, very careful studies of three-dimensional form, which is an assembly of rectangular prisms similar to the assembly of rectangles of suprematism. And boy, that was fast. We went from zero chaos, nothingness, to the black square, to abstract forms, to something that looks more or less like the world today in our cities, the Boston skyline. So um, go figure. These things are also very profoundly connected to the ground. So uh, it's a very interesting thing to look at in terms of how these artists and architects envision the progression from zero to the world. Elizitsky is uh, a really special case where he went very quickly from painting into uh, these depictions of solids um, and then to architecture. 
And this is his design for a, a platform, a podium for making speeches uh, by Vladimir Lenin, the father of the Russian Revolution. In World War II, when uh, the Allied forces uh, fighting against Germany, um, anyway, that's history. We won't get into that. Anyway, Lenin was the key centerpiece of the Russian Revolution, and he was all about forward motion. And so if you look at Soviet-era uh, graphic design, it's got a lot of diagonal lines, which were the graphic symbol for forward progress. And so the architecture has that as well. And so El Lizitsky, uh produced these provocative pieces in the tradition of Boulay and Ledoux, designed huge architecture that's never going to get built. And uh, he called these cloud hangers, uh, giant cantilevered buildings um, that were structurally impossible at the time, um, but provocative nonetheless. Uh, another group from this movement, uh, the Vestman brothers, are looking for ways to take the new technologies and express them in architecture. So this is not a building under construction. This is a building that is transparent. It expresses its steel structure. Uh, it expresses its equipment. This is of the school of thought that buildings become a machine for, for human activities. And so you see an exaggeration of the radio tower, uh, which was part of the new technolo technology of social management and organization. So the key building of this topic uh, that we're focusing on is Melnikov's 1925 Soviet Pavilion in Paris for the uh, Decorative Arts Exposition of 1925. And so he starts with these gestures and these ideas that come directly out of graphic design trends of the early Soviet period, the diagonal, the use of text, the use of expression of new technologies, and um, very much influenced by uh, El Lizitsky's Lenin Tribune Tower. He starts to develop the design for a building that brings all that together, and it's obsessed with this organizing geometry of the diagonal. And so this is his uh, analytique. Remember the analytique? This is his analytique version of that, the technique that comes out of the Beaux-Arts uh, that we encourage you to do when you do your sketches. There's a direct relationship between plan, elevation, uh, and section. Uh, two plans on either corner. Uh, one translates into an elevation, the other translates into a section. So this is him developing the design, and this is the final outcome. Uh, and so it's built in Paris in 1925. It's uh, taken down shortly after the closing of the exposition. But the visual dynamism of this space and the structure uh, is really one of the iconic images of modern architecture. Uh, you'll see. I suspect you'll see this image again juxtaposed with the grain silos that Corbusier was celebrating in his later work in the 20th century. Um, and so you see this very dynamic diagonal staircase that cuts through. So it's a diagonal in plan, it's a diagonal in section, and that is the theme. He's producing diagonals in plan and section. Vertical and horizontal diagonals are what this building is all about. What do those diagonals do, those horizontal and vertical diagonals? Remember, this is how we do architecture. The form is what it is because the architecture needs to do what it does. What does the architecture do and how does it do it? In this case, the whole point is to exemplify dynamic forward progress. It's the opposite of the Beaux-Arts where you give symmetry, stability, solidity, stone, neoclassical, order. And uh, this is the opposite of that. This is the disruption of all symmetry. 
the elimination of all stability and order. This is shaking things up in order to step forward. If you are solid and stable and symmetric with your load, with your weight on two feet, you're not going anywhere. In order to step forward, you've got to move your weight from one foot into the other, and there's a moment of going in the diagonal. If you're gonna move forward, you gotta shift your weight and lean. Believe it or not, that's what this architecture is doing. It's that simple. It's a bodily gesture. And so if you have the opportunity to express what this architecture is doing and how it is doing it, you can talk about stability and, and stasis and staying put versus leaning into it and moving forward, disrupting all stability and all symmetry. And so Melnikoff does that throughout his career, and you get a lot of dynamic things until something dramatic and horrible to some of us happens. The unthinkable happens. All of these explosive modern movements of the early 20th century, they, just as soon as they start to pick up speed, just as soon as they start talking to each other and figuring out how they can join forces, uh, after World War I and presaging the closing of societies that is a, at the, of the 1930s, that bring us World War II, uh, we start to get a closing off of possibilities, a rejection of modernism already in the 1930s. And so the biggest thing that happens in architecture at this time is the competition for the, um, for the capital of the Soviet government. Here's some more early stuff. You start to see housing revolution because if you want to change the way people think, change the way they live, we had a lot of that in the housing um, studio. This is one of the most exciting uh, projects of this period. Um, sorry, the slide is pixelated. Um, but the palace of the Soviets competition, uh, the, the Politburo of the state socialist project of the Soviet Socialist Republic, the Soviet Union, the giant behemoth of socialism uh, after 1917, they decide they're going to take over the world, of course, uh, and so who are you going to call? The architects. So to call all the architects to the task of transforming the world, um, they have a competition. And in 1931, uh, Corbusier designs this complex, uh, and everybody thinks that Corbusier is going to win because he's the new kid uh, shaking everything up. Um, and it's a remarkable proposal that is worth studying in and of itself, but we don't have time for that. So instead, Boris. Iofan, Yofan, Who's, who speaks Russian? How do you say that? Okay, ask your parents. Um, Boris, I'm going to say Yofan, wins. But what's going on here? They dynamite the church because they're Soviet socialists, right? They're, they're a part of the Enlightenment project. Step one, get rid of God. Blow up the churches. Step two, overthrow the Tsar, who's the king of Russia, and create e uniform equality. Everybody is a Soviet citizen. There's pure equality, except for the leaders. And uh, so they're blowing up the church, and in its place, they're going to build the biggest building in history. So it's going to be taller than the tallest building ever. And on top, there's going to be a 300-foot high statue of Lenin. And it's, it's a classical, it's a mixture of classical, Gothic. It's a rejection of everything that's been happening in Russian constructivism. And 
some extremely conservative members of the Politburo at the top of the Soviet infra uh, hierarchy decide enough with this modern stuff, enough with the revolution, we now have to establish stability of our state. So they do the opposite of Melnikov's 1925 uh, Soviet pavilion. That sounds like an excellent exam question. I put this on one side and the Soviet pavilion on the other side. Don't tell anyone. So uh, they do the opposite of the Soviet pavilion. They create symmetry, stability, monumentality, reference to the classical and Gothic past. The party is over. Just kidding. Next Tuesday, there's going to be a whole nother avant-garde uh, thing that's happening in Germany. But don't be surprised if the story in Germany ends a similar way. What happens in Germany in the 30s? Who knows? How, how would you possibly know what happens in Germany in the 30s? Stay tuned, and you will find out. So, how's your in-class exercise going for you? Uh, do you want some more time? Please feel free. If you have any questions, I will entertain them as your classmates continue with their in-class exercises.